I'm sitting across the sea, the color of red wine, while from a distance I can see the purple sheep that braise on the hillside. Now, before you think that I've lost my mind or that I've taken part in one too many Eleusinian mysteries, let me tell you that these are descriptions that come directly from Homer, the greatest poet of ancient Greece. The word inops, or wine looking, was how the sea was described by Homer's principal hero, Odysseus, who, upon his return home and pretending to be a mere beggar, told his unsuspecting wife that he came from Crete, an island among the wine-dark sea. What is all the more fascinating, however, is that among the surprisingly small vocabulary that Homer uses to name colors, there is one missing, blue. Overlooking the Aegean under the bright Greek sky, it is impossible to think that Homer, of all poets, could have missed this ever-present color that bays the scenery. How can we even begin to make sense of this? Could Homer, or ancient Greeks for that matter, have been colorblind? This surprising question was first raised in 1858 when a British politician and self-taught classicist, William Ewart Gladstone, who would serve a total of 12 years in office as prime minister, published a monumental survey on Homer called Studies on Homer and the Homeric Age. Gladstone believed that the works of Homer were the most extraordinary phenomenon in the whole history of human culture. And so he set out to examine every aspect of this mythical world, from the geography of Odysseus' journey to the moral character of Helen of Troy. And between the last pages of the last of his three door-stopping volumes, he made a strange observation. Homer's description of color was entirely different from what we would expect today. In particular, the sea was never described as blue. Honey appeared as bright green and the sky the color of iron. After the publication of his works, theories raged with one scholar even suggesting that some of the wines produced in ancient Greece might have actually been blue. One obvious suggestion is that Homer was describing exactly what he saw when overlooking the sea, as the Aegean can at times appear to be of a blue-crimson hue, especially at dawn or sunset. This would be consistent, in fact, with the views of at least one Greek archaeologist, Dr. Alexiou, who published a similar view in 1986, suggesting that the solution to this problem lies in the careful examination of nature on the East Mediterranean and the Aegean. In other words, Homer observed his subject matter like a true poet and reported on the impression it gave at the exact moment of observation rather than how it should have looked on some ideal case, making him perhaps the first impressionist. But way of examples, Alexiou provided verses of modern Greek poets like Yorgos Seferis and Constantine Kavafi, who also used variations of purple to describe the sea, suggesting that these descriptions were essentially impressionistic, similar perhaps to the purple shadows cast by the trees on Van Gogh paintings. But even if that were to be true, and Homer was an early impressionist, it does not explain the total absence of blue as at least one of the possibilities, nor does it solve the mystery of purple sheep on Cyclos' cave. Gladstone had a surprising answer. He believed that in a certain way, the Greeks of at least Homer's age were in fact colorblind, or rather that the visual organs had not yet fully developed during antiquity and were unable to perceive the world with the accuracy that we have been accustomed today. According to this view, the colors that we perceive today are the result of a progressive education of the eye that came in the last millennia. Well, back in the middle of the 8th century BC, the time of Homer, the world was mostly black and white with dashes of red, as the latter color, erythro, was used accurately to describe things that were actually red. The reason for this progressive education, Gladstone concludes, was the recent manufacturing of synthetic colors that has produced a world where everything can be red, blue, green, or any other color. 
from cars and fabrics to our electronic devices. Gladstone's views were not well received, to say the least, and through a long review of his works, Time magazines called him nothing short of an idiot. One of the reasons that made his theories so hard to defend was the lack of scientific backing. Remember that all this happened in 1858, when even Darwin's book on the origin of species has not yet been published. But once it did, a year later, Gladstone's theory started to appear a little less mad. But in order to explain this strange phenomenon through Darwin's theory of evolution, there should be some consistency between Homer and other ancient sources. And surprisingly, there is. The Bible, for instance, also describes honey as green and mentions a red horse not far from Homer's red oxen. And while the Hindu Vedas go through great lengths in their depiction of the heavens with its refracted play of light and color, there is one color missing from its entire palette. You guessed it, blue. Still, and with all this evidence to support his theories, Gladstone's views were unable to hit the mainstream, with additional reasons being perhaps political rather than scientific. As apart from a student of Greek, Gladstone had served a total of 12 years as Prime Minister of England. Despite this partial criticism, however, it is highly unlikely that evolution can account for the differences in Homer's vocabulary, since for changes like these to occur, hundreds of thousands of years are needed. Unless one, of course, believes in the X-Men. But as scientifically unsound as his theories seemed, Gladstone was dangerously close to an idea that has today taken roots in modern society. The idea that reality, and to a certain degree, is a product of culture. Finally, a solution was to be found from the most unlikely of places, a zoo, where a dehumanizing spectacle was presented in 1878. Around 30 natives, men, women, and children, taken from their homes in Sudan were exhibited next to wild animals as exotic specimens of our race. They were called Nubians, and scientists gathered around to study them. To their astonishment, they discovered something that Gladstone could have easily predicted. A total lack of a particular word. Blue. Well, during that time, evidence came pouring in from all corners of the world, confirming Gladstone's theories that a sense of color needs to be developed culturally as well as physically. So, does this mean that the sky appears blue only because I'm told so? Well, not quite. See, when researchers administered their Nubians a Holmgren test, which was recently developed to test for color blindness in train conductors, the results showed that their subjects could in fact distinguish between hues of green and blue by matching like-colored strings, but simply lacked a word to voice their distinction. The mistake Gladstone made was to assume that the colors described by Homer were the colors he saw, and that a lack of words mean a lack of the thing they describe. Only that, as another scholar explained, we use three eyes to see, two physical, while the third, that of the mind. Even today, with all our sophistication, we still make the same mistakes. We speak of wines as white, while in fact they are pale yellow, and orange juice is in fact pure yellow rather than orange. This doesn't mean that we are incapable of perceiving facts, but rather, that our language forces our minds to categorize these facts differently. So now, can we finally answer our question? Were the Greeks colorblind? And the answer seems to be probably not. Just like the people from Sudan, Homer could have almost certainly been able to match the color of the sky to a test palette, but lacked the word to express it, at least with the accuracy that we expect today. On the flip side, Greek language offered an increased accuracy when it comes to the subject of love, as it distinguishes between friendly and romantic, paternal and motherly, philia, eros, agapi and storgi respectively, with most words being used in a similar way throughout Greece today. <laughs>